当然。那地地主也是，农民谁也是呀？当然地主，那上面团的生长率吧，上面团的上面大些嘛，农民谁也是地主的地，那上面大些就是种，多一些嘛啦。现在咱们就地地些，咱农民谁也是啥？你就建起来建住了，建没过来建又没嘛，也是。那云南建那个多，云南建的那七建那哪里建？地那个多哪里建？生产的多，也是啊。在地面种啊，养啊，其他呢，养不多，生产的，他们大量的团结，马里的团结，种啊，养起多的。你地基主要对啊，你做南的什么，大些什么种啊，大些团结，那地基主多也是。那地呢，咱咱们对嘛，就什么，干的是，呃，那做野干的，什么干的是，那做地主起火的，什么干的是，苗子，什么干的是，苗子起火的，是。Good evening. Our long for happiness, as well as our unwanted, as all suffering which is unwanted, these both come about in dependence on causes, and these causes are, are either internal, other consciousnesses, or external. And of those two classes of causes that lead to happiness and suffering, the a primarily, or the primary cause, is inner. In other words, in dependence on a way of thinking, happiness is achieved, and in dependence on another way of thinking, or a faulty way of thinking, suffering is experienced. So of the two sets of causes, inner and outer, the dominant, the most important, is our way of thinking. So this is something that we need to think about for ourselves, to recognize its validity, its truth, because that will encourage us to seek out which are the ways of thinking that are helpful, in other words, that will lead to happiness, and then ensure that we adopt them, that they influence us at all times. And conversely, we'll seek out those ways of, of thinking which are harmful, and we'll strive to abandon them. <laughs> ดูมาดีดูมาดูมาเสียดายดูมาดูมาเช้าวันดูมาเนี่ยเราดูมาอย่างนั้นเช้าตัวเราดูสัมปันธ์ดิแล้วมันเช่นอย่างนั้นดู
And then amongst these, we see that at the very root is the ignorance of self-grasping, as well as grasping at oneself as dear, or the self-cherishing mind. Here, we recognize a stream of dependency that unwanted, in this illustration, physical suffering has come about in dependence on causes, and we can look at a variety of causes, but that certainly includes on having this body. And this body too came about in dependence on, on a variety of causes, and there we can trace this back to karma and um, what led to the accumulation of karma, afflictions. And those afflictions start as they uh, have as their root the ignorance of self-grasping and grasping at oneself as dear. So this continuity needs to be reflected on so that we can come to recognize the cause of our suffering. We're recognizing that the and, 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 and in this process of recogni recognizing the cause of our suffering, we expand to see the full role that these root the root cause, um, the grasping at oneself as dear, the, the role that it plays. Seeing that it's from this uh, mind of ignorance that grasps at oneself as, as dear, the self-centered attitude, from this attachment um, arises, and from attachment comes anger, pride, and all the other afflictions. So there's this stream of continuity that from grasping as oneself as dear follows attachment and the array of afflictions. And these afflictions, they may arise or cause, causes us to suffer, and their expression causes suffering to come to others. For example, from it, um, so, uh, the, the self-centered attitude comes attachment, Come from that comes comes harmful intent, the wish for harm to come to others, and then one brings harm to others, either through our physical behavior or our verbal way of communicating. We need to reflect like this, so as to come to see the true true role that the self-centered attitude, this grasping at oneself as dear, plays, how it brings so much harm and pain into our lives, as well as then through <laughs> the expression harm into the lives of others. This then, to the extent that we re rec uh, reflect on this and come to recognize the harm that the self-centered attitude plays, we'll watch out for it and strive to abandon it. <laughs> That then in brief is what we looked at last week. The role that the self-centered attitude plays in, in keeping us trapped within samsara and bring harm to others. And this is such an important meditation to engage in, reflecting on that role, so as to come to see that this chronic disease of, of cherishing ourselves is what leads to all our unwanted suffering. Because to the extent that we come to recognize that this attitude, the self-centered attitude of ours, is the cause 
leading to all our suffering, to that extent that we recognize this, we will want to abandon it. And giving rise to the wish to gain freedom from the self-centered attitude will come the thought, of course, how to do so. And as with the, the, the other antidotes, we need to develop a mind that is contrary to the one that we wish to gain freedom from. And that is holding others as dear. To overcome the um, grasping at oneself as dear, we need to develop an attitude that rather holds others as dear. In order to actually generate this other cherishing mind, holding others as dear, not only do we need to recognize the faults of the self-centered attitude, but we need to also recognize the benefits of holding others as dear. Those two meditations are required in order to give us the strength of mind to both abandon the um, holding oneself as dear, as well as to ensure we stay under the influence of holding others as dear. Turning to the 92nd verse, Please bless me to see that cherishing all mothers, wishing to place them in bliss, is the gateway to infinite virtues. May I cherish these beings dearer than my life, even should they rise up as my enemies. This verse then presents the other cherishing mind. Right now, we are uh, under the influence of the self-cherishing attitude, holding ourselves as supreme. So here, we find that the attainment of our happiness and our own abandonment of suffering is our primary motivation. That is the, 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 exp the expression of the self-centered attitude. Here, rather, we need to come under the influence of holding others as dear, which is the development of minds of love and compassion, where we want others to abide in lasting happiness, all beings to abide in lasting happiness. This is the mind of love, and all beings to attain freedom of, of, from, from suffering. This is the mind of compassion. This is the meaning of holding others as dear. <laughs> In the previous meditation, we reflected on the faults of the self-centered attitude, which is where we place our happiness 
and freedom from suffering first and foremost. And we recognize the role that that attitude plays in terms of us pushing the needs of others aside so that we achieve our own wishes first and foremost. The goal, as expressed in, in this verse, is to completely reverse that attitude, now rather placing the needs of others first and foremost, their happiness before our own, their freedom of suffering before our own. So here, what to develop this attitude that holds others as dear, we need to generate love and compassion for all beings. In order to generate love and compassion for all beings, in order to generate the, uh, uh, this other-focused mind, first, one requires a deep and sincere aspiration to do so. To the extent that we have such an aspiration, we will strive to fulfill it. To the extent that we lack such an aspiration, we will not apply ourselves wholeheartedly to develop the other cherishing mind. So to generate this, this aspiration, we need to reflect first on the benefits of the other cherishing attitude. And to the extent we come to recognize the, the many and great benefits of placing the needs of others first and foremost, we'll give rise to the aspiration to develop the attitude holding others as dear. <laughs> The Tibetan starts with cherishing all mothers. So here, in order to give rise to an attitude where we hold others as dear, we need to completely turn around our current self-centered attitude. And to do so, we need to develop a, a, a sincere warmth deep within towards all others. Right now, we have experience of that. There are those that we are close to, and just hearing their voice or calling them to mind, a warmth arises within us. But there are also a group that we don't like, hearing their, their names, calling, um, uh, uh, calling, call, calling them to mind. No warmth comes. This is what we need to change. So here we need to broaden our attitude, take this narrow, close mind that divides the, uh, the fr be uh, beings between those that we are close to and those that we are distant to towards, take that narrow mind and shatter it, reflecting on this interdependent relationship we have with others, that across lifetimes, the kindness they've shown to us, the benefit they've brought to us, again and again, through varying roles and interactions, both direct and indirect. This is what we need to, to reflect on, so that we develop a warmth, an equal warmth, towards all beings. <laughs> Mm. 
Nedeni herhalde doğru için insanlar şeyin sevdi. Ben de büyük bir yer diyen şeyin de sevdi ki bakıyız. Size şeyin gibi, ame gibi, hani çeke, şey var ya, demek sosu ya, çaman çeke, şey şeyler var ya. Size deni herhalde sözü büyük bir yer diyen şeyin de sevdi ki bu. Ben de hani tova diyen şeyin de sevdi ki bu. Size sosu ki şeyin gündeye çaba da şeyin de sevdi ki bu. Size de sosu olana ki jambar o çeke. ที่เกี่ยวกับดูเรื่องที่เนี่ยเสวะคุณมาเนี่ยเช่นอะไรที่เนี่ยเสวะคุณมาเช่นเมื่อไหร่เสวะคุณมาเกี่ยวกับอะ
recognizing that all that we have achieved, we did not do it alone. We were largely, uh, we were, uh, what we've achieved has largely been achieved because of others. We've played a role, but others were dominant in our, in every success we've had. And everything that we long to still achieve will only be achieved in dependence on others. We are not self-existent islands. We are dependent on others. And reflecting well like this will lead us to, uh, to the next line, wishing to place them in bliss. So what, this, what this means is that we'll give a rise to the, 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 the awareness of wanting these beings who have helped us so to experience only happiness and to be freed from all forms of pain and misery. A deep yearning within us will arise that may these beings who have directly and indirectly been of such benefit to me life after life, may they be freed of pain, may they be freed of misery and experience only happiness. Meditation and starts with recognizing our entwined relationship with others, giving rise then in this in the second line to love and great compassion for others. Here then, we also come to recognize, as the second line continues, wishing to place them in bliss is the gateway to infinite virtues, or rather than virtues, infinite good qualities. Here we recognize that all good qualities, whether temporary or the ultimate good qualities relating to Buddhahood, all of these come about independent on the kindness of others, because it's through the kindness of others that we are, find ourselves where we are today, that we find ourselves able to engage in meditations and love and compassion, and when, to the extent that we're generating love and compassion, this is all dependence on the kindness of others. And all the good qualities that we will achieve, the good qualities of the Mahayana that we will achieve through our generation of love and compassion, all comes, comes about in dependence on the kindness of others. And here then it's good also to reflect on how these uh, good qualities, or the, what we have here as virtues, how these infinite good qualities arise in dependence on others. Now you can tell what you have. 
你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人在这里,你一个人
and therefore we will engage with them in a way that is harmonious and that and in return others will trust us will like us will want to help us and we will not encounter hardships and difficulties from others because of our harmonious attitude or harmonious relationships with others Reflecting on these infinite good qualities, we do so from a number of, of differing uh, perspectives. We look at the benefits that will be experienced in this life by ourselves as well as others, and the benefits that will follow in lives beyond us for ourselves and others. We look at those benefits on a mundane level in terms of, for example, harmonious relationships with others, as well as looking at it on the level of our spiritual development, seeing how a loving and, and, and compassionate attitude aids our practices of generosity, ethical restraint and patience. And as we develop our love and compassion and develop our generosity, ethics and patience, we will develop these minds, uh, the minds of love and compassion, into bodhicitta. And when we generate bodhicitta itself within us, then our already advanced training in generosity, ethics and patience and so forth will become actual perfections. And in this way, we will have entered into the gateway of the Mahayana and we will be striving towards the attainment of actual enlightenment. So therefore, we reflect here on the, these infinite good qualities in terms of the benefits in this and, and lives to come, as well as for self and others in this and lives to come, as well as mundane benefits as, and the spiritual or ultimate benefits. To the extent that one develops love and compassion within oneself, 
vast, vast, immeasurable benefit comes to others. To the extent that one is genuinely loving and compassionate, one will sincerely and skillfully help others. It will never be a burden to be there for others. It will never be overwhelming to be there for others. In fact, when one encounters someone, great joy will arise, not just the joy at meeting a mother being, but at having the opportunity to find a way to benefit them. If they're in poverty and one has an abundance, one can help alleviate the material suffering. If they are physically suffering, to the extent that one has skill, one will readily um, uh, um, uh, help, help them gain medical treatment, or at the very least, will comfort them tenderly. Well, in fact, whatever needs they have, perhaps for um, education or, or, or skills that one has, one will readily, wholeheartedly give of oneself to them. And as one develops close relationships with others, and others are in inspired by us, we will be able to influence them into turning towards the skillful means that will lead them to develop a path in their own continuum, lead them towards generating actual bodhicitta themselves and progressing rapidly towards enlightenment as well. So in this way, we see that through independence on our own spiritual development, the way that we repay the kindness of others is both in a temporary or mundane way, but also in a transmundane way, helping others develop an actual path in their continuum. <laughs> Love and compassion is an indispensable prerequisite for a being to become a bodhisattva and thereby attain the paths of the Mahayana, the paths of the bodhisattva. So this is should be abundantly clear. But also for practitioners of the hero or solitary realizer lineage, they too will generate love and compassion. And when they attain a path as well, they will have powerful love and compassion on their continuum. And even for very ordinary practitioners such as ourselves who are yet to generate a path, compassion plays an indispensable role. The aspiration we have to generate all good qualities, this comes with our, our compassion, our wish for patience, our, our, our aspiration to generate sincere refuge, as well as our aspiration to, to generate, um, have a, a, a truly ethical outlook, as well as to give rise to an aspiration for liberation. All of these come with compassion or come from compassion.
This will probably uh, need some explaining that how do uh, both heroes and solitary realizers as well as uh, ordering beings such as ourselves who are yet to generate a path, how does our spiritual development come about in dependence on compassion? So our good qualities and attainment of a path, our, and our, our eventual attainment of a path, how does that come about from compassion? Here we go back many centuries to when Buddha Shakyamuni first turned the wheel of Dharma, illuminating the path. He did so due to his compassion for all suffering beings, which of course includes us. Turning the wheel of Dharma, illuminating the path, he taught first the Four Noble Truths and he taught it in differing ways, perfectly in accordance with the disposition and inclination of his audience. And through his many teachings, so many beings attained a path, even attained liberation and enlightenment. Many others uh, ordained and accumulated great stores of virtue. All of this came about independent on the Buddha illuminating the path. And he illuminated the path due to his compassion. <laughs> The importance of compassion is probably not possible to exaggerate its great importance. Every practitioner requires compassion developed to an extraordinary extent in order to generate bodhicitta initially and attain the paths of a bodhisattva. But the need for compassion doesn't end with the generation of uncontrived bodhicitta. For the bodhisattva to progress along the varying paths, their compassion needs to grow and develop ever further. So therefore, 
for progression on the path, compassion is required. And even when the paths are completed and the, the, the fifth path of no more, more training is attained, it is due to the compassion within the continu continuum of a Buddha that they engage in enlightened activities for beings. So therefore, the very foundation of, of, of the eventual attainment of paths is compassion. For progression along the paths of the Bodhisattva, it's compassion is required. And so too, is compassion required f within the continuum of a Buddha to ensure that enlightened activities are enacted. yeah, I encourage you to reflect on the central role compassion plays in the generation of virtue. Compassion is indispensable to generate bodhicitta, it's indispensable for the bodhisattva to develop the six perfections, and when those are perfected and enlightenment is achieved, compassion is still indispensable for the enlightened activities of Buddhas. So it's in this way we can say that all happiness comes from compassion. To the extent one reflects on this, the determination, the aspiration to develop compassion oneself will arise. There's a direct correlation between the aspiration one has to develop a particular good quality and the strength and determination one applies oneself to develop that good quality. So therefore we need to reflect in many ways on the great need for compassion. It's many benefits because this will lead us to the, de generate the determination to cultivate compassion for all beings. It's through this reflection that we'll see that compassion is the gateway to infinite good qualities. And to the extent we have generated this determination to cultivate compassion, then we go to the next two lines. May I cherish these beings dearer than my life, even should they rise up as my enemies. It's only having a genuine attitude of compassion that will ensure that even when beings are harmful, act in a way that's harmful towards us, we will still hold them dearer than our own life. Yeah, 
all ordinary beings, humans, animals and so forth, hold their own life as most precious. Here, in dependence on the reflection in the previous two lines, one comes to hold compassion as most precious. More precious than our own life is the compassion we have generated in our mind. And therefore, even if every being were to rise as our enemy, our determination wouldn't be to protect our life from all these enemies, but to ensure that our compassion is not lost, because nothing is as valuable as our compassion. The Tibetan concludes with what our verse starts with. We, the whole uh, meditation is done uh, within the context of holding our Lama before us. We ask that may he bless us so that we quickly generate compassion and the compassion that we already have, it grows and strengthens. So this is how the verse concludes with requesting his blessings. Mm-hmm. 
So this verse is presenting um, the the benefits or how to cultivate the um, other cherishing mind or holding others as dear, and this and what it, the other cherishing mind is the cultivation of a tender attitude towards others, of having a loving and compassionate attitude towards all others. So how to generate this attitude that holds others as dear comes about through, firstly, reflecting in the way that are presented on the many benefits of holding others as dear. So this mind is the mind of love and compassion. And that we need to then reflect, as I mentioned earlier, on the benefits that come to oneself as well as others. So that's one pair. Reflect on the benefits that will come in this life to oneself and others, and then in future lives, or life to life for oneself and others. So that's a second pair. The third pair is to think of the benefits, the ordinary benefits or the worldly benefits that will come, as well as the spiritual development that will come. So that's a third pair. And reflecting on these, the benefits that come to self and other, this life and future lives, as well as the ordinary and spiritual benefits, reflecting on these leads to the determination to develop love and compassion within oneself. And this is a crucial prerequisite in the meditation, the reflection on benefits, because to the extent that we develop this aspiration to de develop love and compassion within us, we'll apply ourselves to these meditations. And when engaging in the meditation, as I've mentioned in, in previous talks, alternate between first analytical meditation, then placement meditation, then analytical again, placement again, and so forth. Analyzing, for example, with the benefits. And each time an emotion arises, wanting to give rise to uh, uh, the other cherishing attitude, then abide, place one's mind there. And then when that the mind becomes a little distracted, then once again in, uh, continue with analysis. And when one again gives rise to the aspiration to develop a loving, compassionate attitude, abide with that. And then this meditation one can combine with what one looked at earlier, or, or in, uh, last week, the kindness of others, the benefit they bring to others, again alternating between analytical and placement meditation. Because as one engages in this meditation, recognizing the benefits of having a loving attitude, and then love are actually arising for others, this is what we want to generate, this loving attitude or this compassionate attitude. May others experience only happiness. May others be freed of suffering. Each time it arises, stop your analytical meditation and place your mind there. Hold it still in an undistracted way. Then when the mind tires or you lose the object, then again engage in, in analytical meditation. And this way, strengthening our habituation to a loving attitude and a compassionate attitude. Yeah, 
No beings are complete strangers to love and compassion. We all have the seeds of love and compassion on our con continuum. However, our habituation to these minds is weak. This is what we need to develop, develop our habituation to these wholesome minds. So therefore, I encourage you to have a daily meditation practice cultivating love and compassion. So this is crucial to have this daily meditation practice. But what is also indispensable is that when one is not engaged in, in formal meditation, one keeps recalling use, which, or using mindfulness to, to recall the love and compassion generated in meditation. So that as we're going about our day, what we are thinking about is love and compassion, holding all beings as dear, recognizing our close and interconnected relationships, seeing all beings as, as precious, just like we relate to our children or our parents, and recognizing that those are actual relationships we've had with each and every being that we'll see or whose voice we'll hear or who we call to mind. We have had those relationships in past lives and may well have them again. This way, we, if, we, if we reflect in the daily meditation on love and compassion, as well as calling it to mind after the meditation session too, just like a young plant will grow and strengthen and eventually bloom, so too will our love and compassion grow and develop and eventually bloom into bodhicitta itself. And the learning with the Kimi Masha, the Shen, the Kaisu, the Dang, the Ranches and Summit, the Dang Tibet, the Mulu, the Edwin, the Jelly Ranches, the Dang Tibet, the Ranches and Summit, the Mulu, the Ranches and Summit, the Kimi, the Kimi, the Kimi, the Kimi, the Kimi, the Combining what we looked at last week and this week, we can start in the meditation by reflecting on the fault of the self-centered attitude of grasping at oneself as dear, reflecting again and again on the faults of being under the influence of such an attitude, and developing the term determination to abandon this chronic disease. And then combine it or follow from there with reflecting on the great benefits that come from holding others as dear. Reflecting again and again on these, bring about the determination, or for, sorry, firstly bring about the recognition about of, of the kind of person we long to be, someone who is naturally, spontaneously loving and compassionate towards others. And then bring about this determination combined with the recognition that not only do I want to be such a person, I have the ability to be such a person. And in fact, I commit to ensuring that I will become such a person in this very life. So from now, I will use this, the chance, whilst I have this chance, I will cultivate these minds. Ensure I don't come under the influence of the self-centered attitude, but rather 
and guided by genuine love and compassion. And just like all skills that we have developed in this and other lives, the stronger the skill means the stronger our habituation to it. So if we engage in this meditation again and again, we'll be able to recall or be mindful of our training no matter how challenging the circumstance. So all people who are skilled in a particular area and who can habitually act in a particular way, they, are, they can do so because they have trained themselves, trained their minds. So when this training, the meditation proves difficult and it's difficult to transform one's mind and one uh, falls down or fails again and again in our daily life, persevere, don't give up. This is the training. We will have obstacles, we will find it difficult, and that's okay. There's no need to be discouraged, there's no need to give up. If it were easy, it would be done. But it is possible, and it's possible for all of us, as long as we persevere. And in your meditations, I encourage you, use reasoning, analytical meditation. At first, the reasonings will be quite superficial. But as you get habituated to them, you'll naturally go deeper. But you'll only go deeper if you have become habituated to the coarser meditation. And then you'll start to see subtler links, subtler reasons to abandon the self-centered attitude and subtler reasons to, to develop the other cherishing attitude. <laughs> Ne <laughs>
wherever in your own life you recognize that a relationship with someone is disharmonious, whether slightly or extremely, only one approach will help, and that is to develop loving kindness within oneself. Anger will never help. Only a tender heart will help heal this relationship. And similarly, where you see between the relations between others, where there is disharmony, the only solution for them to adopt is to develop an attitude of loving kindness towards each other. Where we can so see that this is true is if a, a child is in distress or an animal is in distress, an angry response will never soothe their pain. Just a response that is kind and tender. So if this is the case with children and animals, so too with adults who carry their own deep inner hurt and pain. This we need to reflect on, so that no matter what we encounter, we know that the only response is one of loving kindness. The solely is appropriate. To the extent that we can generate this within ourselves, we will transform the relationships that we currently have with all beings, as well as the, both those who are in our lives now, those who are on the peripheries of our life, and those who will come into our life. To the extent that we generate love and kindness, love and kindness within ourselves, we will be in harmony with others. We can't make others develop a loving, kind attitude, but we can heal relationships by developing that within ourselves. Then, certainly from our side, we will feel a sense of closeness, an interconnection with everyone we encounter. And in this training, also recognize that whenever any degree of unhappiness arises within oneself, any degree, look for the role of the self-centered attitude. It will be there. And this will serve to rec uh, for you to recognize ever more the need to abandon the self-centered attitude. It lies there deep within, beneath all our unhappy experiences, slight and strong. And likewise, when we bring ever more pain and suffering into the lives of others, look within and you'll see the role the self-centered attitude plays. See it as our chief enemy, as the cause for all our pain, and strengthen your resolve to love all beings, to be compassionate, genuinely compassionate towards all. <clears throat> and thank you very much. We'll conclude therefore tonight. Thank you.